Chapter 3. Understanding derivative. This chapter is very important for your M9A study because a derivative is one of the core contracts or product within a structured products. Now, we're going to cover what exactly is derivative and then we're going to cover uh, four types of um, basic derivative that occur inside of a common uh, structure products. There are futures and forwards, uh, option and warrants, swaps, contract for difference. All right. Um, let's set some expectation. We are covering the basic structure of a derivative. All right. Um, we are not about to teach you how to trade derivatives, but we are just studying the basic uh, fundamental of derivative. All right. Now, what are derivatives? It is basically a contract that derive their value, financial value, from an underlying asset. I repeat, derivatives are contracts. That means they are legally binding between two parties. Right? That derive their financial value from an underlying asset. Now, what do I mean by underlying asset? It can be anything. It can be shares. It can be bond. It can be currency. It can even be commodity. For instance, like soya bean, gold, copper, iron ore. All right. It can also be index, STI index, Hansing index, or Standard and Poor 500 in the United States equity index. All right. So derivatives are very highly flexible legal contracts that binds two parties over the period of time. And they derive their underlying values, their financial value from the underlying assets. All right. It's a very unique uh, financial products, but we have to study in details the, uh, the strength and also the weakness of uh, delivery contracts. Okay. Derivative on futures and forwards. Now, uh, let's begin our discussion with the first set of derivative we're going to discuss, which is uh, futures and forwards. Futures and forwards, they belong to the same uh, uh, classification under derivative. They are contracts, they are legal contracts. They are giving the obligation, an obligation, a legal obligation to buy and sell the underlying asset at a specific price, at a specific price that is spelled out in the contract on a specific date that is going to be delivered, all right, at a specific quantity. Three things. Therefore, these contracts buy two parties on the specific underlying assets at a specific price on a specific date to be delivered and a specific quantity. All right? It buys one party to sell and it buys one party to buy. It's a legal contract. Now, just give you one example. Let's assume on the 12th of June 2020, we have A, which is a face mask producer, say in a in a country, uh, example Taiwan, and uh, B is another legal entity called a Singapore Hospital. Just a just a hospital in Singapore. They enter into a forward contracts to battle the COVID nineteen situation. What well, these forward contracts talk about? A will manufacture the face mask and agrees to sell ten tons, ten tons of face mask to a Singapore hospital to be delivered on twelve August. 2020, that means in two months' time, specific date. 10 tons of face mask, specific quantity, at $10 per box, specific price. Now, this is a forward contract. You might ask, what is the advantage of having forwards? Forwards remove the uncertainty from a buying and selling of pricing, quantity, and delivery date. Company A, which manufacture face masks, they are being assured of a market that is going to buy their products. We are talking about 10 tons of face masks, which is a lot, all right, at a specific price. Entity B is a Singapore hospital. They are assured of a specific product that they need in two months' time. And therefore, they can plan their budgeting, they can plan their logistics supplies back end. And therefore, they can focus on providing their services, which is medical services and healthcare, to the Singapore public. Therefore, the forward contracts in this situation, what does it do? It removes uncertainty. 
it removes uncertainty from this particular transaction of buying and selling of a specific product at a specific date. Earlier section you talk about, we talk about the forward, con the forward contracts are between two parties, all right? that spells out the uh, specific price, specific quantity of a specific underlying asset to be delivered at a specific time. Now, at that specific time, two things can happen for the forward or the future contracts. Number one, physical delivery. Party A manufactured the face mask to be delivered to a party B which is a Singapore hospital in two months time. So what happened in two months time? Party B received the physical stock of the 10 tons of face mask. That is called physical delivery. Trades are done like this. However, over time, a forward contracts are also being used for cash settlement. It becomes a financial product. Meaning to say, besides physical delivery, forward contract can also be used as a form of financial contracts, usually for hedging purposes. But the technicality of that is beyond uh, the discussion of uh, NIA. All right. But at this point, just be mindful that at the time of settlement, it can be done by cash settlement, meaning to say that party B will pay party A certain amount of money besides receiving the stock of face mask. Now, in the world today, most of the settlement that is settled by forward or future contracts, close to 95% of it are actually cash settlement. Only 2 to 5% of it are physical uh, delivery of the underlying assets. In the for the purpose of us studying derivative as a form of uh, uh, part of the main players in uh, structured products, we are talking about cash settlement, using forward and future contracts to structure together with a traditional investment product for client. We are all talking about cash settlement. We are not talking about physical delivery in the context of M9A M8A study. Okay, let me now explain to you what's the difference between forwards and futures. In the beginning, the very first contract that comes out is actually forwards. It's a forward contract. Forward contract are between two parties that binds both parties with the obligation to buy and sell. Two parties. They buy between two parties. The technical term we call it over the counter. That means it trade over the counter between two parties. These two parties are huge entity. They are not private individuals, they are huge entity. For example, SIA, an airline company in Singapore, and uh, ExxonMobil, an uh, oil company from the United States, but majority of oil are from uh, Saudi Arabia. All right? So when we say over the counter, meaning to say that there is no there is no established exchange in between them. SIA will deal directly with ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil will deal directly with SIA. There is no middleman or middle exchange in between. All right? So therefore, as a result, the contract is highly flexible between these two parties, between SIA and ExxonMobil. They can negotiate the terms, the underlying asset, the pricing, the quantity, the delivery date. As a result, we call it non-standardized. Another term for non-standardized means it is highly customized to the two parties, so long the two parties legally agree. Now, the trading of a forward contract are not subject to margin. Margin is a term in derivatives, meaning if suppose the contract is $1 million, you need not come out $1 million to establish a contract. You just have to place a margin of say 10%, 100000 to trade that particular contract. However, for forward, you do not need to have margin, all right? No payment, no buying happens until the delivery date. The settlement of gains and losses, gains and losses will happen on the delivery date. If this particular contract is two months, meaning to say that within these two months, SIA don't pay anything. ExxonMobil also don't receive anything until the date of settlement. The date of settlement, say in two months time, then SIA will pay something to ExxonMobil or ExxonMobil will pay something to SIA. 
All right. This is what this is what we mean by settlement of gain and losses only happen on the delivery date. Now, with this understanding, let's compare the difference between forwards and futures. Futures is a contract that got its idea from forwards because of some of the perceived weakness of forwards. Now, for futures, it is traded through an exchange. An example of an exchange in stock market is the stock exchange of Singapore, the SGX. Derivative also has got an established exchange. Um, the very first exchange was in Chicago in the United States in 18-something. Uh, right? It is through this exchange that you can trade futures. Meaning to say, if two parties buy themselves, buy themselves in buying or selling, before the date of settlement, that particular contract can be sell, can be can be sold, or can be purchased through an exchange before the settlement date or before the exercise date. Future can do that. Forwards contract cannot be done or is very difficult to do. Now, step for futures, you trade through an exchange. In order to trade through an exchange, the contract has to be standardized. Unlike forward, SIA will know the counterparty, ExxonMobil, and ExxonMobil will also know its counterparty called SIA. In the futures contract, both parties might not know each other because it is not necessary. The trade or the legal responsibility or liquidity is undertaken by the exchange. Correct? Therefore, you need a standardized contract. For a future contract, unlike a forward contract that derives a settlement only on the exercise date or the delivery date, a future contract will have settlement on a daily basis. All right, what we call partial settlement of gain or losses in a daily manner, mark the market value. All right, trading of futures because it is doing a settlement on a daily basis, it is therefore subject to what we call a margin. It is from this margin that the investor either collect a profit or top up the margin if there's a loss on a daily basis when they mark the futures values on a daily basis. All right. Therefore, when we call subject to margin in a futures contract, if the futures contract is $1 million, let's say the margin is 10%, 100000 the investor has to put 100000 to trade in this particular uh, legal contract called futures. All right? This is what we mean by margin. These are the differences between forward and future. Let's go through some of the um, common questions that will be tested on you. A forward contract is between two parties, it trades over the counter, whereas a future trade through an exchange. A forward contract is non-standardized, it's highly pri privately designed or customized, whereas a future contract is standardized contracts. All right. uh, forward contracts is not subject to margin because it's due a settlement on their delivery date, whereas on uh, futures, it's subject to margin and then uh, there will be partial settlement on a daily basis all the way until the exercise date or the delivery date where the contract ends. Okay, let's talk about the pricing of the forward contracts. We have this term called the forward price. Forward price. Let's term it as FP. It's equals to the spot price. Spot price of the underlying asset. For instance, spot price of the underlying asset called gold or spot price of the underlying asset called coffee bean or soya bean or a financial index. All right. Plus the cost of carry. Cost of carry. What are cost of carry? Let's assume that the underlying asset is oil. Cost of carry means the logistic. You've got to store the oil before it being shipped out. The shipping cost from point A to point B. The insurance. And also some other logistic, miscellaneous logistic costs of bringing this particular product to the party who buy it. Usually it's cross countries, all right? Now, so therefore, mathematically, if forward price 
minus away the spot price what we call the difference between forward price and spot price can either be positive or negative depending on the economic situation demand and supply and sometimes uh, certain general market risk that can cause it to be positive or negative for the purpose of your understanding in this uh, book let's remember forward price minus the spot price if it gives you positive it means the cost of carry is at a premium this is the commonsensical and normal situation because you have to factor in the cost of bringing the product additional cost of bringing the product from point A to point B so 90% of the time it should be like that however there will be certain situation where FP minus spot price give you a negative uh, results that is possible under this situation we call it a discount your cost of carry is having a discount what are these situations usually happen during a disaster usually happen during a war situation or usually happen during a financial crisis situation in which despite you incur the cost of carrying the product from point A to point B you still have to get the contracts because you need the particular goods so therefore under normal situation it should be at the premium however if there's an economic crisis situation or certain general market risk for instance right now at the point of recording we are in a COVID-19 situation all right most of the forward price the cost of carry are actually having a discount in a negative situation okay let's end the chapter on uh, forwards with some practical example of forward contracts example energy oil and natural gases all right all commodities it can be food it can be medicine all right it can be raw materials all right uh, two terms on commodities if it is on a physical deliver delivery all right between a manufacturer factory and a uh, end user what we have cif or fob uh, cif means cost insurance and freight all the entire cost of uh, this particular uh, uh, delivery cost from point A to point B are being reflected into the contracts uh, another type is uh, free on board FOB free on board meaning to say that um, when the goods reaches the ship when it uh, leaves the harbor to another country exporting out the buyer will pay for the transportation the shipping cost from, uh, from the harbor of the producer to the harbor of the party that receiving the goods all right and um, the buyer will pay for the transport and then um, they will quantify the cost and add over and above onto the contracts all right but at this point in time for the purpose of us studying uh, structured products just briefly understand the uh, practical example the pricing of forward contracts the difference between forward and futures it will be sufficient for your understanding at this uh, textbook all right just now we talk about the condango situation but there will be situation because of the world situation world economic situation or general market risk situation there could be situation in which your spot price actually is higher than your future price before the contract reaches point x which is the exercise date it's highly possible because the the pricing of the underlying asset is free now under this situation you take a look at month number two at the month number two when we do the pricing settlement of the future contracts we find that the spot price of the underlying asset is higher than the future price uh, this situation is what we call a backward backward vision situation all right just to recap under normal situation when the future price is higher than the spot price of the underlying asset is what we call a condango situation for instance example in this graph in month number one all right the blue line is above the red line over here is a condango situation this is a normal situation under a unique risk situation when there's economic crisis or there's a disruption in demand and supply this thing can happen all right in which your spot price is higher than your future price now this situation is what we call a backwardation situation all the way this thing can happen all right 
uh, until the uh, settlement date. The settlement date in which the future price ought to be the same as the spot price of the underlying asset. Okay, trading of futures. As mentioned, future there's an exchange in the center which ensures the liquidity. You have party A, party B enter into a future contracts. Now, future contracts are traded on margin. What are margin? Margin is a percentage of the actual value of the contracts. For example, if you enter into an oil contract, let's assume the oil contract is in a, a $1 million. Let's assume it's Singapore dollars, right? So, uh, $1 million. All you need is, say, 10%. To, to enter into this particular contract, you need not come out $1 million to purchase this contract or to enter into this future contract. All you need is, say, 10% which is a percentage of the value of the contract at the point of issue. Yeah, yeah. Handphone. Right. Now, to handphone game. how much, what's the percentage of initial margin? Okay. It's all determined by the exchange. The exchange will take a look at party A, your credit worthiness, uh, how deep are your financial resources. They can decide 10%, 5%, some even demand say 20%. Sometimes it's also a function of uh, what type of contract are you trading. All right. Now, because the way that futures is being traded, you need a margin. This gives rise to what we had learned earlier chapter about this thing called leverage. What is leverage? For example, if you have got $1 million cash, $1 million cash, technically you can enter into 10 future contracts. Meaning to say that this is a one, one contract is $1 million. You need to come out only 100,000 to secure this contract. And if you have a $1 million cash, you can enter into 10 of such a contracts. Your exposure, your investment exposure will be $10 million. Now, from 1 million, I magnified to 10 million. This is what we mean by leverage. The advantage of leverage meaning to say that if for whatever reason, there is a 10% gain or 30% gain, your gain is magnified. Yes, when terms are good. But as a financial advisor, we ought to understand the risk. The reverse is true. If for whatever reason, the market go against what you have anticipated, your loss is also multiplied by 10 times. All right? There's a reason why when we trade futures, it, it is a legitimate derivative contract. No dispute about that. But there is a leverage risk. On the future contracts. Be mindful that when we talk about futures, both party has got the obligation to fulfill the contract at the settlement date. And for futures, both party has got the obligation to settle the value of the future contract on a daily basis until the settlement date. All right. Let's recap. Futures are traded on margin. What are margin? Margin is a certain percentage and initial cash outlay to enter into this contract. For example, 1 million, 10% initial margin, 100,000. Okay, let's further our discussion about the meaning of margin. There are three terms you have to understand very well. Um, let's assume this future contract is $1 million. The broker or the exchange will specify the initial margin required. Let's assume it's 10%. The 10% is an assumption. It can be 5%, it can be 20%. All right? Let's assume it's 10%. Therefore, the initial margin IM is 100,000. Now, the exchange or the broker will also specify a maintenance margin, say 5%. 5% is an assumption. It can be 7%. All right, it can be 8%, it can even be 3%. Let's assume it's 5%. Therefore, for 5% of 1 million is 50,000. All it means is that as the future contract is marked to market for settlement on a daily basis, all the way until the settlement date, if the contract fall, if the contract fall below the maintenance margin, the broker will issue a margin call to the investor to top up the account back to the initial margin. I repeat, a future contract 
is mark the market settlement on a daily basis all the way until the settlement date meaning to say at the end of the uh, trading day they would compare the pricing of the futures uh, contracts between both parties they will be gained they will be lost all right positive or negative if the value of the contract fall below 50,000 the broker will issue a margin call whether electronically or by phone call to the investor to top up the account all the way up to the initial margin all right now this top up to the initial margin is a term a technical term called a variation margin variation margin so this whole system will continue all the way on a daily basis until the settlement date until the settlement date let's give an example this is the example taken from the book example gold futures assuming the initial margin is uh, 2500 the maintenance margin required is 2000 let's assuming after one day this is the t plus one say one day the contracts fall below 2.3 thousand uh 2300 under this situation when we compare with the maintenance margin of two thousand dollars all right even though this future contract drops in value the investor will not be issued a margin call it is still okay let's assume it's now is t plus two the same contract falls to one thousand five hundred one point five k the broker's computer will compare this one with the maintenance margin of two thousand this one fall below the maintenance margin the broker will trigger off a margin call onto the client margin call onto the client to top up from 1.5k all the way to 2.5k that means on t plus 2 one thousand dollars from the investor is required to top up his trading account from 1.5k to 2.5k the topping up of that additional one thousand dollars back to the initial margin situation is the variation margin is the variation margin so therefore there are three margin you need to know number one initial margin which is the starting point say a certain percentage of the value of the contracts the second margin you need to know is called maintenance margin meaning to say on a daily basis what is the minimum maintenance margin before a margin call is being triggered off to the client and the third term is the variation margin it is a top up amount when the margin call is being issued that the investor need to top up to the initial margin now at this point in time some of you might feel a bit concerned how does an investor make money the investor actually can make money if on a daily basis the futures value are more than say the 2.5k assuming on the t plus one the value of the contract becomes three thousand dollars all right actually the investor make five hundred dollars in this situation we are talking about what if the contract falls below the maintenance margin and what are the actions required by the investor this is looking from the position of risk which is the financial advisor's responsibility to explain to the client okay let's talk about who are the market participants for futures as i explained margin in earlier part you might see that the risk of futures if you trade individually is very dangerous however let me explain to you who are the market participants for futures and maybe perhaps forward uh, contracts we are the hedger and the speculators you take a look at the reason the reason are highly legitimate especially for hedges the English meaning of hedging means to protect. The reason to buy is to lock in a price. You want to buy a product, you receive it in three months' time. You want to purchase a shares in, in three months' time or two months' time. You can lock in a price and you protect yourself from the price going up. You lock in the price and you protect yourself from a rising pricing rising price of the underlying assets now for hedger the reason to sell you can enter into a future contract to sell to lock in a price a sale price and protect yourself protect your own interest from a foreign price of the underlying asset 
Therefore, you can see for hedging, for the hedger, the reasons to buy, the reasons to sell are perfectly legitimate to locking a price and protect yourself from uncertainty of rising or pricing for buying or falling or price from selling. Now, the controversial one are the speculators. The speculators are also market participants of futures and forward. What do they want? They want profits. They want profit from rising pricing, rising prices of the underlying asset, or profit from falling price, prices of the underlying assets. How do they do it? Because in order to trace the future contracts, the speculator will do a anticipation of the future pricing of the underlying asset. They will enter it using margin. And they hope that the actual outcome of the underlying asset matches their anticipation. They do this for the purpose of uh, profiting. Now, in our context of studying the structured products, most of the structured products that uses futures contract together with a traditional investment product for investment purposes for financial planning actually come from the hedger side. The hedger side. All right. So, reasons to buy, reason to sell between hedger, speculators. Therefore, with this particular chart, I hope you begin to understand that a future contract has got legitimate reasons to exist in a very positive way in the financial market. From the hedger's point of view, the controversial part that we read on the newspaper is actually talking about the speculators or the financial crisis uh, story we read about from as a result of derivative or as a result of back outcome of a derivative are actually the speculators. As financial advisor, it's very important for us to be logical, to be impartial. We have to understand this particular reason of hedging as well. It is this hedging or the existence of hedges that give rise to the top process, the concept of futures and forwards. Let's talk about future trading strategy. Now let's put things in context. We are just explaining to you the futures uh, strategy. All right? In the context of structured products, um, the investor is not coming to this situation. All right? But however, because we are explaining to you the fundamental uh, basic of future contracts, we have to study about the futures uh, trading strategy. All right? Now, let's example taken from your book. It's a MSCI Taiwan June futures at uh, 220 index points. All right? Let's assume the initial cash outlay uh, is um, 220 points, which is at the point of the contract, multiplied by US $100 per point. Now, this US $100 per point is specified by the issuer that issued this MSCI Taiwan June futures contract. It's an assumption. All right? So let's assume it's $100 per point. Therefore, the initial outlay an investor need to put into it is 220 multiplied by US 100 per point, which is uh, 22,000 US dollar, right? Now, this is a future contract, meaning to say that at a certain point in time, you have to do a closing, okay? Let's assume at the point of closing, the MSCI uh, Taiwan's stock index closed at 0 0.242, 0.242. Now, this 0.242, you can't control. It is to the future. Let's assume in the future, it closed at 242 points. Your entry point, was 220 all right therefore there's a index point difference will be your 242 which is in the future minus away 220 give you 22 points therefore the investor will make again a profit a payoff of 22 points multiplied by 100 dollars per point meaning to say that the investor uh, overnight or over a certain time, make 2,200 2, out of the future contracts. That is on the positive side. From the risk angle, because in this situation, we are assuming the closing index is at 242. At the closing index, because it's talking about the future, it can also close below 220. 
let's assume that it closed below 220. Let's assume that it is 200. Let's assume it's 200. Therefore, the starting part of it, you enter the contract is at 220, closing at 200. You will actually make a loss. There's a point difference of minus 20 points. All right. Therefore, there is a potential loss. 200 times US $100 per point. Therefore, there is a potential loss of $2,000 USD. All right. So this is speculation, speculating of uh, future contracts. Potentially can be positive. Potentially can also be negative. Because you can't control the closing price of the underlying assets. I'm going to explain to you one particular features of what you can do futures in which traditional investment product cannot do. What we call shorting. In the traditional investment uh, product or the insurance policy, a client purchase a product in anticipation of rising price in the future. If for whatever reason the market goes down, there's nothing much an investor can do. However, in derivative, you can actually profit from a falling market by shorting. Shorting means to sell. In this case, it's short. Hedging means protect. You protect a portfolio with a derivative called a futures. Now, let's assume this example taken from the book. A fund manager has a mandate to manage a $1 million equity portfolio in Singapore. In other words, this $1 million consists of a portfolio of Singapore equities, the Singapore stocks. And then the portfolio of this Singapore equity has a beta in comparison with a benchmark called a Singap the STI index. Which is an index in Singapore, a representative index of the uh, one of the 30 most liquidable uh, and credible SGS stocks. Now, 1.2 beta means what? For every 1% of increase in STI price movement or the point movement, this portfolio will react in 1.2%. In other words, if STI go down by 1%, this portfolio will also go down by 1.2%. Now, let's assume that at this time of speaking, this we are in January. STI now is at 1,850 points. And this fund manager has to anticipate his anticipation in two months down the road in March STI, he anticipate a falling market of 1,800. All right, this is the fund manager's anticipation. He wanted to protect the value of this particular portfolio in the event that this thing happened. All right, let's assume that he can find a brokerage or an issuer to design these future contracts for them. Let's assume that this contract is $10 per STI point. Therefore, the price coverage per future contract is $1,800, which is here, multiplied by $10 per point, which is $18,000. $18,000. What are we driving at? We are driving at, in this situation, the fund manager in anticipation that in two months down the road, the market will fall. In anticipation. Now he could go wrong, but this is in anticipation of a falling market. And he wants to preserve the value of this $1 million equity portfolio. Not so much to profit. The objective is to preserve or to protect what we call hedging, the value of this one in a falling market. In a falling market. Therefore, for one Future contracts, the price coverage is 18,000, you calculated. Therefore, how many future contracts this fund manager need to short in order to preserve the value of this $1 million of equity portfolio? It's where we talk about hedge ratio. Hedge ratio is the value of the portfolio, $1 million, divided by the price coverage per contract of 18,000, which is over here. Multiplied by the portfolio beta. In this situation, the portfolio beta is 1.2.
this gives rise to 66.7 or we round up to 67 contract what are these contracts these are future contracts what are the underlying asset STI index what is the price per point of the STI index $10 per point when is the delivering date in two months time all right all it means is by using futures let's assume that in two months time the outcome of STI index actually matches the fund manager's anticipation of dropping from 1850 to 1800 this particular portfolio value will drop in according to this part here all right however the drop of this portfolio will be mitigated or compensated in terms of dollar value by the profit made by selling these 67 future contracts all right so when you combine the future contract together with the equity portfolio over here you can see that with a wise usage of derivative futures in shorting it you can preserve the value of this one million dollars in a falling market this is the beauty of derivative and futures let's end our futures uh, uh, trading strategy with one last part which is very commonsensical long hedging with future contracts the word long meaning to say that you purchase these future contracts with the anticipation with the anticipation in two months down the road one month down the road the market will increase because futures you are trading using margin therefore with a small amount of dollars you can actually get yourself exposed to the entire value of that portfolio that you want the word hedging mean to say that this particular strategy is not so much to profit in a very extraordinarily in the capital market it is used to capture that particular profit or the pricing that you want in two months down the road all right example let's assume that an insurance company launched a new investment linked policy funds say the emerging market funds example we are collecting the premium from the clients it takes time to collect the premium because it takes time for the insurance advisor to sell the products the insurance company can make use of future contracts to long an equity index say three months down the road while collecting the premium in a very large scale from the clients and in this situation they can start to launch an ILP funds without having the necessary entire cash to purchase the equity index at the same time they can benefit from the anticipating rise in the capital market let's for reason let's assume the world economy is going to recover from the COVID-19 situation in say six months down the road this is pure anticipation let's assume that the chief economist of the insurance company after studying all the various uh, economic indicators make a judgment call to say that perhaps the world will recover in six months down the road it is pure assumptions all right now the insurance company we are collecting the premium from the client from the policy holder which take time can actually profit from the anticipated rise in the equity market by going into a long hedging with a futures all right so with derivative with the understanding of what exactly a futures is the combination and the physical application of futures can actually take advantage of a rising market can also preserve the value of a portfolio in a declining market now this ability to profit or to protect in anticipation of a rising or the declining market is something in which a traditional investment product cannot do okay let's now address the um, the next category of derivative we have went through futures and the forwards next we come into options and warrants option and warrants what are options 
it is a right. It is also a legal contract that grants the right between two parties to buy or sell. An option to buy is called a call option. An option to sell is called a put option. It grants the right, but not the obligation. I repeat, the rights, but not the obligation. Compare option with futures. There's a specific time. Say you're supposed to exercise the particular contract in two months down the road. If this is a futures, you need to exercise the buying or the selling. But in option, you have the rights. But whether or not you want to exercise it is optional. It's optional. And therefore, you are not obligated to exercise the contract if you, as an investor, deem that the, future, the underlying asset at the exercise date is not in your advantage. Right? So in that aspect, option is less risky than futures. Okay? Now, similar to a future contract, you need an underlying asset. What are the underlying assets? Let's focus ourselves on financial assets. It can be interest rate, it can be equity index, it can be a bond index, right? It can be equity price or bond price. It can also be currency. At a specific quantity, similar to futures, at a specific price that you want to buy or at a specific price you want to sell in the future. In the future. Alright? And the technical term is called exercise price or strike price. On a specific date, you have to exercise this particular contract either on or before the specific date. In the technical term, in option, they call expiry date or sometimes they call it the exercise date. Now, an option contract. There are two broad categories in the market. One is a European style, one is the US style. In the European style, this option contract can only be exercised specifically on the specific, on the specific expiry date. Let's assume that this is an option contract to purchase the DBS shares. DBS shares. This is a core option to buy DBS shares at $30 per share in two months. Let's assume that two months is 12th of August 2020. Let's assume that. If this call option is European star, if this call option is European star, today is 12th June 2020. This option can only be exercised on 12 August 2020. Here. This is what we mean by the European style. When we say exercise, what does it mean? It means at this point in time, if you got one contract, you are able to purchase the DPS price at $30. If on 12 August DPS price is traded at $50, you will still make a gain of $20. As simple as that. If on 12 August 2020, the DBS price is trading at $10, all you need to do is that you don't exercise this particular contract. And that's all. Okay? Now, the United States style is more interesting. It's more flexible. Same contract, call option to buy DBS share at $30 per share in two months time, 12 August 2020. However, in between from 12 of June all the way to 12 of August, if at any point in time you find that DBS share has increases to more than $30 per share, you want to take advantage of that and that particular incident happened before the expiry date. If this call option is a United States style, you can actually exercise it on, for example, 12 July 2020, before the actual expiry date. If it's on the European style, you can't. You can't. You can only exercise over here. 
Therefore, you can see that the United States style is more flexible. Now, with flexibility, it comes with a price. Meaning to say that a core option, if it is on a United States style, it is more expensive than a European style. Right? Now, so for the purpose of this, uh, the book that you are studying for structured products, we are assuming your core option or your put option is the European style. All right? Now, before we go on to the next session, let's brief, give you a brief understanding of what Warren is about. Warren is in the same asset class as options. It is also a legal contract that grants you the right to either buy or sell it all right, at a certain underlying asset of a certain uh, uh, quantity at a certain date. But however, in terms of time horizon to expiry date, for option usually is in months. It's rather short, usually it's less than a year. Sometimes can be even weeks. Whereas warrants can be years, five years, three years. And warrants is usually issued in a Singapore context as a sweetener that come with a stocks of a listed company. All right. Uh, these are futures and warrants. Just now we talk about call option. Now I just change the term into a put option. What is a put option? It grants you the rights to sell the underlying asset of DBA share at $30 per share in two months down the road. The rights to sell. That means you fix the selling price today. Accessible in two months time. Similarly, you purchase this particular contract today, exercise date in two months down the road. In between now to exercise date, this piece of contract is tradable. Now, under what situation this piece of contract during now to the exercise date, is there any value? It depends on the strike price versus the market price of the underlying assets. The scenario is, the outcome is completely opposite we call option. In put option, the intrinsic value will be positive or what we call in the money will be when the strike price the strike price to sell is higher than the market price today. The intrinsic value will be zero if the strike selling price is less than the market price of the underlying assets before the exercise date. The intrinsic value can also be zero when the strike selling price is equal to the market price of the underlying asset. Is in the act the money situation. Okay, now let's understand the risk return profile of a call option. You have to be very familiar with this particular chart. Right? Now the vertical axis indicates the profit or loss of investing in this particular call option or call warrant, which is give you the right to buy an underlying asset at a specific price at a specific date. Now, the horizontal axis represents the price of the underlying asset, the price of the underlying asset. Let's assume there's a strike price here, the vertical line over here, the point X is a strike price, right? Now, if at the exercise date, the price of the underlying asset is more than the strike price of the call option technically speaking there will be a profit to the investor right the profit is actually unlimited let's assume that is um exercise date the price of the underlying asset can be here the profit is tremendous but the reverse is also true what if at the exercise date the price of the underlying asset falls below the strike price all right. The loss, the maximum loss is limited to the premium of the call option, which means to say that the price you pay to buy the piece of call option, for example, $10, $1 per option. All right. So therefore, that is the limited loss, the, the maximum loss is actually limited to the premium that you pay to buy the call option. Why? Because an option contract gives you the right but not the obligation 
So under this situation happens when your uh, strike price is more than the market price of the underlying asset, you simply just let the call option lapse. You did not, you are not under legal obligation to exercise it. All right. As a result of that legal cross, therefore your maximum loss is only con contained to the premium of the call options, whereas your gain potentially is unlimited. This is the risk return profile of a call options. Okay. Risk return profile of a call option or a call warrant. Let's be very familiarized with this particular charge in which uh, we're going to describe to you the various option strategy. Now, the vertical axis talk about if you invest in this call option, what's the profit or loss that you can have at the point of exercise? The horizontal axis represents the price of the underlying assets. Now, let's assume that at the point of exercising that particular uh, option contract, the call option, the price of the underlying asset falls here, which is much higher than the strike price. The profit is tremendous. The reverse is also true. At the point of exercising the contract, the underlying asset, the price of the underlying asset can fall below the strike price. Under this situation, the loss is limited to the premium of the call option, which means the price that you use to pay for the call option, for example, $10, $100 or $1. Depends on the options. Now, why is this so? Because uh, option contracts grants you the rights, but not the legal obligation to exercise it. So therefore, if at the point of exercising the contract, the underlying asset falls below the strike price, all you need to do is to let the call option lapse. You are under no legal obligation, unlike a future contract, to exercise these particular contracts. Hence, the maximum loss is limited to the premium that you pay. The potential gain is actually unlimited. This is the risk return profile of a call option or a call warrant. Okay. The risk return profile of a put option. A put option is an option for you to sell an underlying uh, asset at a predetermined price in the future time. It is totally opposite with a call option. Therefore, you take a look at this uh, graph over here. Now, if at the point of exercising, the price of the underlying asset is below the strike price. In this case, the strike price is the price to sell. So therefore, the strategy of the specific outcome that you require, that you anticipated for the put option, is you want to profit from a declining market. I repeat, you enter into the put options, it's for the purpose you want a specific outcome in a declining market, a good specific outcome of a declining market. Meaning to say that you would like the underlying price of an asset to fall, say in two months down the road, less than to fall below the strike selling price of the underlying assets. Therefore, if at the point of exercising, the price of the underlying asset fall below the strike price, the profit is unlimited. It can be tremendous. Now, if at the point of exercising, the price of the underlying asset is higher than the strike selling price, the investor shouldn't exercise the put option, just simply let it lapse. What would be the maximum loss? The maximum loss will be the premium of purchasing this particular put option, say $100. $1 or $10. Therefore, you can see the loss is limited. The gain is unlimited for a put option. Now, let's be mindful what is the meaning of put option? An option that gives you the rights 
but not the obligation to sell an underlying asset at a specific price at a specific time. All right, just a very brief description of the exotic option. Exotic option are option contract that put in certain condition within the contract itself about when to exercise, when not to exercise, what is the pricing, and things like that. All right, we can read the description of the book from the book. By and large, you have the Asian exotic option, forward start, compound option, chooser option, burial, binary, rainbow, and swap tone options. Do read through the book in the brief description of these uh, various exotic options. Okay, let's examine the basic option trading strategy. The top process is, let's anticipate what the market will be. You have to make a judgment call. Let's assume the market will be bullish. It's just a pure anticipation, all right? A bullish meaning to say that the market of the underlying asset will go up, say two months down the road. Now, the very first strategy we can have is what we call a long call. Let's understand the terminology. Call is a call option. You have to buy the call option. Long meaning to say that you purchase this call option in anticipate that the market will go up in near future. With pure anticipation, you can go wrong, of course, all right? But it's just an assumption that you have to make a judgment call on. Now, how will you make profit? You can see in this particular chart, if at the point of exercising this call option contract, say two months down the road, the price of the under asset is here, say at X, you will make the profit over here. Now, if two months down the road, at the point of exercising the contract, the price of the underlying asset, underlying asset falls below the strike price, say here, say point Z, you are under no legal obligation to exercise this call option. You just simply let it lapse. And therefore, what is your maximum loss? Your maximum loss is over here, which is the price or the premium that you purchase the call option. Premium or call option. All right. Now you might ask, Alan, what's so great about this strategy? Now we are typical, we are actually using the power of leveraging, meaning to say, you just spend say one dollar or ten dollars to give you the rights to purchase an underlying asset in two months down the road. If the market appreciate go up, you can simply exercise that particular contract and make profit almost immediately. Let's give you one example. Let's assume this call option is for DBS shares at $30, the strike price. At exercising date, assuming the underlying price of DBS shares goes up to $50. At this point in time, all you need to do is to exercise the contract by paying $30 for one DBS shares and you sell it to the market immediately for $50, you will make a profit of $20. This is the profit from underlying assets. All right, you minus off the premium. Let's assume the premium is $1. This is the premium of call option. And therefore, your net profit is $19. This is your net profit. I will explain the leverage concept over here. You are using $1 to gain $19. This is the power of derivative. This is the power of leveraging. You use a small amount of money for maximum exposure. You might ask, what is the downside risk? The downside risk will be, at the point of exercising, shares of the underlying asset fall below $30. Let's assume it's here, it's $20. All you need to do is to let the call option lapse. So what is your loss? 
your loss will be the one dollar of co-option. This is your loss. Your loss is limited to the price that you pay for the call option. Therefore, can you see from this chart, this particular chart, if you anticipate the market to be bullish, you need not come out a big amount of money to purchase the underlying asset right now. You just have to secure a legal right to purchasing to purchase it, say in two months down the road. If the price of the underlying asset fall above the strike price, you will make. If the underlying asset pricing fall below the strike price, you simply let the call option contract lapse. Your maximum loss is limited to the price, the premium of the call option. So therefore, this is a very simple but very effective market strategy for a bullish market anticipation and it's what we call a long call strategy. Okay, the second strategy if you anticipate the market will be bullish. And with one assumption, the investor already own a portfolio of stocks. I repeat, the investor already own a portfolio of stocks. He can sell a call option. In technical term means right. Write a call option. Write a cover call option, which means that you sell a call option to another entity, usually the bank or another person, on a stock already owned. You already have the underlying assets. All right. Now, if at the point of expiry date, the price of the underlying assets is higher then the strike price, you will make a profit. The profit comes from the sales of the stocks you already own. You already own. Because you are selling the call option to another party, therefore your profit is limited to the price that you had decided into the call option that you sell to another party. Now, if at the point of exercising the expiry date, the price of the underlying assets is less than the strike price of the call option, the counterparty would let the call option lapse. Meaning to say, you as an investor, you actually make some profit from selling the cover call options. You make the profit from the premium of selling the cover call option to your counterparty. Because you're still owning the portfolio of stocks, so technically speaking, you had a paper loss of that portfolio of stock you already own. You already own. But because you already own it, the loss over here is actually a paper loss. You have not realized the loss physically yet. Now, let me explain clearly. Cover call option is a conservative strategy that you anticipate the market will be bullish at the exercise date and you do not mind to sell your portfolio of stock at an agreed price. Now, let's assume that today is 12 of June 2020. Let's assume that the exercise date is 12 of October 2020. Now, In 12 of June, you sold the cover call option to a counterparty. Your source of profit to you as an investor is the premium that you sell it to them. $10 or $100 per, call, per cover call option for one stock. All right. In 12 of July, one month later, you collect another premium from this call, cover call option. In month of August, you collect another premium. 12 of September, you collect another premium because the um, underlying the underlying um, price of the assets is still not advantageous to the counterparty. Now, on the 12th of October, 
on the 12th of October, when the exercise date comes, assuming that the uh, underlying price of the underlying asset is more than the strike price, then you sell away the stocks that you already have. Therefore, the source of profit comes from the sales of stock own. So therefore, therefore, with cover call option that you sell it on a monthly basis, you will find that we are holding on the stocks you can actually profit by deriving a call option and selling it and you make certain premium income from it. This is the strategy for cover call. So for the purpose of your test, just remember that cover call is one of the bullish market strategy in option trading. Okay, the third bullish strategy is what we call a protective put, a put option. Put option is an option allow you to sell the underlying asset at a specific price at a specific time. In this situation, you already own a stocks. You already own a portfolio of stocks. What you want to do is that you wanted to have some sort of a downside protection just in case. For example, if you are a fund manager, you own a, a portfolio of equity stocks. You anticipate the market is bullish, yes. But you want to have some sort of a downside protection if the market go against what you have anticipated. Right? The assumption here is that you already own the underlying asset. Okay? Now, you will buy a put option. What is a put option? It's the option for you to sell at a specific price. And it's an option. You are under no obligation to exercise it. If it's not in your advantage, you can just simply let it lapse. The maximum loss that you can have is the premium of the put option. All right? So, graphically, you are going to be like this. If at the point of exercising that particular uh, option, if that market price of the underlying asset is more than the strike price, in this case, say X over here, all right, you simply make lesser profit. Why is it lesser? Because you spend some money to purchase the put option. Now, if at the point of exercising, the price of the underlying asset fall below the strike price, you can exercise the put option to sell it at an agreed price. Therefore, your downside protection is protected over here. Because you already instituted a potential buyer when market declines. Therefore, this is a very conservative it's a strategy in anticipation for market is going to increase rising but just in case you got it wrong you want to have some sort of a downside protection you want to have some sort of a downside protection this is an example of a protective put under a market bullish condition of your anticipation okay the last uh, bullish strategy a controversial one is you sell a naked put option. The word naked in the option trading technology meaning to say that you does not own the stocks. You does not own the underlying asset. And you sell a put option to a counterparty. Can be very risky. If ever the counterparty need to exercise the option, you have to find somewhere to purchase that particular underlying assets in order to fulfill this contract. Highly risky, but we just studied the fundamental of it. On what basis, why people want to do this? Now, notice this strategy falls under the bullish market condition. You anticipate the market will be bullish, say, two months down the road. You sell a put option to a counterparty without having the underlying asset with you. You sell something that you don't have yet. Now, if Two months down the road, the market indeed go according to what you have anticipated, means market increases. Your counterparty will not want to exercise the put option because he can sell it better in the secondary, in the market itself. He no need to exercise your contracts. 
Meaning to say that where, do, where does your profit come from? Your profit come from that premium that you collected from day one by selling this put option to the counterparty. However, the risk is tremendous because at the point of exercising, if the price of the underlying asset really fall below the strike price and your counterparty will exercise the contract, you have to purchase, you have to purchase from the market itself the necessary underlying asset and honor your put option contract, which will subject yourself to actually maximum loss. Your profit is limited because it's premium. Your loss is unlimited. But nonetheless, this form part of a strategy. If you anticipate the market to be bullish two or three months down the road. Okay, we have examined market anticipation to be bullish. Right now, what if we anticipate market to be bearish? These are all anticipation, you can go wrong, but you have to make a judgment call as an investor. Let's assume that you anticipate the market will be falling, which is bearish. What are the two options tra trading strategy that you can benefit or you can make profit out of a falling market? Now you can only do this with derivative. You can't do this with a traditional investment products. Now, the very first strategy is a very straightforward one called a long put. Long meaning to say you purchase a put option, an option for you to sell at a specific price, at a specific time. Therefore, when you buy a put option, you anticipate it or you want the market to fall. You can profit from it. Say two months down the road, the price of the underlying asset fall to here. Say point X over here. Your profit is unlimited. However, let's assume you got your judgment wrong. Three months down the road, at the point of exercising that, uh, that option contract, the put option, um, the price of underlying asset actually rises more than the strike price. Therefore, all you need to do is to let your put option lapse. Your maximum loss is only contained to the premium that you pay. The premium that you pay for the put option. Therefore, your maximum loss is limited. Your potential gain is unlimited. Now, in this strategy, as simple as it looks, it allows a invest an investor to profit from a falling market. Uh, this is one very huge advantage in which the, deriv the derivative contract can achieve, whereas a traditional investment uh, product cannot achieve. Okay, market anticipation neutral. What does it mean? Meaning to say as an investor, I want to profit, market goes up, or market decline in say two, three months down the road. So therefore, if I combine call option and put option of the same underlying asset at the same time, I can actually profit from either outcome of the capital market. This is what we call a bull strider strategy. I buy simultaneously a call option and a put option of the same underlying asset. As I said, also the same. Now, two situations can happen. At the point of exercising, two months down the road, for example, the price of the underlying asset goes this way. That means the market goes up. All I need to do is to exercise my call option and I profit from it. And I simply let my put option lapse. What is the maximum loss of my put option? It's just the premium that I pay for the put option. But I gain tremendously for my call option. Now, scenario one. Scenario two, two months down the road, market decline tremendously. All I need to do is that I can exercise my put option and I gain tremendously and I simply let my call option lapse. So the maximum loss on my call option is only the premium that I pay for the call option. Therefore, by combining the call and the put option at the same time, I can actually remove the worry of uncertainty about market movement two, three months down the road. Isn't it amazing? Now, what's the catch? The catch of this strategy, there are. This strategy hinges that you must make a judgment call that the, either the market go up, go up tremendously. If it fall, it fall tremendously. If the market 
at the point of ascending take, only move up a little bit or drop a little bit, you lose both sides. But let's take a look in perspective, in the right context. Even if this situation happened, what is your maximum loss? You lost, you just simply let your call option and your put option lapse. And your maximum loss is contained by the premium that you paid for the call option and the premium that you pay for the put option. So by combining a call and the put option together, you can actually potentially profit from either market goes up or potentially market goes down. Right? Another market anticipation, anticipation strategy of neutral, that means you want to profit from either market uh, goes up or market goes down, is the best rather. A best rather is interesting. You potentially sell a call option and a put option of the same underlying asset at the same time to a counterparty or to a few counterparty. You sell. You sell, immediately you profit from the premium that you selected. And then you hope that your counterparty will let the call option lapse or let the put option lapse. I repeat. You profit by collecting premium upfront. And you hope your counterparty do not exercise their call option or their put option. Under what situation? Yes. Let's assume in three months down the road, the market only go up a little bit. Under this situation, there is no economic incentive for your counterparty to exercise the call option. So therefore, you profit from the premium you collected from the call option. If three months down the road, the market dropped a little bit, there's also no incentive for your counterparty to exercise the put option. Therefore, you also profited from the premium that you collected from the put options. Now, this, however, you could see this, con this strategy can be highly dangerous, risky, because if ever one party exercise the, the contracts, the options, you potentially has got unlimited loss. So therefore, this particular strategy is that the investor anticipate the market either go up or go down a little bit. Whereas a boost rider, the assumption is the investor anticipate the market to go up tremendously or fall tremendously. That are the two differences. Okay, let's talk about swaps. Swaps is an agreement, essentially it's a contractual agreement between two parties, two parties, which agree to exchange cash flow, cash flow of an underlying reference asset. Nothing is purchased, nothing is being sold. There is no transfer of asset to a counterparty. All right? They just agree to exchange certain cash flow at the future dates. At the future dates. Now, in recent times, these are the various uh, 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 swaps contracts that an institution can purchase from investment banks. All right? You have interest rate swaps, currency swap, credit default swap, equity swap, and commodity swap. I'm going to explain to you by the purpose of having the interest rate swap for you to have a better understanding of what this is all about. Come. Interest rate swaps. As the name suggests, what is interest rate? Um, is two counterparty, two party, they want need to borrow money from the bank to continue their business, working capital or whatsoever. All right. Now, assuming A, is a company that he wanted a fixed lending rate so that it can budget the cash outflow. Typically, it's like a manufacturing firm. All right. Um, for whatever reason, he cannot get it from his country. All the banks is only willing to lend him this entity at variable or flexi rate. Now, B is an entity say in another country, he wanted a flexi rate. He wanted a flexi rate 
to raise capital having a flexi rate but for whatever reason he cannot get a flexi rate in his country therefore entity a and entity b can go into a swap agreement arrangement between two parties and exchange certain cash flow let's assume the consideration is us 10 million dollars we use usd so that we can normalize the exchange rate differences between the two countries uh, rather the two entity a and b now a will continue to borrow from bank a us dollar 10 million and pay the flexi rate to bank one but internally on a yearly basis or on a money basis a will have a contract with b a swap agreement contract that i will pay you a fixed interest rate based on this us 10 million and b will also borrow the same us 10 million from his country bank number two at fixed rate so on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis all a and b need to do is to have an internal agreement binded by this agreement that a will pay the fixed interest rate on the us 10 million to b b will use this fixed interest rate and pay towards the bank and b will pay the flexi rate to a and a will use this flexi rate payment received from b to pay the bank so a swap agreement i mean an interest rate swap it removes the disappointment for entity a for not being able to have access to certain financial product that he needs so swap agreement is a derivative that allow a and b to gain access to certain financial products that they otherwise cannot get it now as you're talking about this a and b here there is certain potential risk in swap agreement meaning to say counterparty credit risk for whatever reason if b go into liquidation he can't pay the cash flow to a a will get into trouble the reverse is also true if a for whatever reason become insolvent he cannot honor the cash flow to b b will get into trouble with his bank too now it's an agreement this agreement usually there's a time frame say for two years example two years it can be three years it can be one year it can be six months all right let's assume it for two years for two years the whole thing will stop a will pay back the 10 million working capital back to bank one and b will pay back the 10 million back to bank two or they refinancing again or they refinance themselves have another agreement again all right so in this situation what are the cash flow that is being exchanged the interest rate payment is there any transaction between a and b answer is no the 10 million remain with a when they borrow by a the 10 million borrowed by b remain with b what do they do this contract exchange the cash flow of interest rate why is that so for whatever reason b cannot have the financial product that he wants he wanted a variable or a flexi rate but he cannot get a for whatever reason wanted a fixed interest rate but he cannot get therefore with a swap agreement it allows a and b to have the financial product that they could otherwise cannot have to materialize for a period of time okay currency swaps the second type of swap swap is an agreement where two parties agree to exchange the cash flow now so what cash flow does two parties exchange in the currency swaps let's assume party a party b these two are entity all right one could be an airline company one could be a petroleum company or an IT company, huge institution. Like, let's assuming that uh, party A uh, needs US dollar for working capital, but for whatever reason cannot get it, but can have good access to Singapore dollars. Airline company, for example, in Singapore. Now, party B 
in another country for whatever reason they need sing dollars but cannot get for whatever reason they can get um, USD US dollar so therefore therefore party A and B can enter into a currency swaps contract say for two years it can be one year it can be six months in this example we just assume that it's for two years party A will borrow from his bank the necessary sing dollars of a reference amount say assuming US 10 million dollars right he borrow this is sing dollars party B will borrow US 10 million in the bank in the country that it is located right so party A will hand over on the contract the entire 10 million dollars US 10 million dollars worth of sing dollars to party B for its working capital and party B will hand over the US 10 million to party A they will pay the interest rate respectively to the banks A will pay the interest rate to bank 1 B will pay the interest rate to bank 2 but the main point of currency swap is to swap the currency in which entity A or B cannot get for whatever reason in the country they are operating in sometimes entity A can be a country entity B can also be a country All right now so currency swap enable an entity to gain access to a financial product it otherwise are unable to get it for whatever reason during the short period of time all right derivative called currency swap allowed this to be able to fulfill 